Hi everyone, this is Meg. I'm another one of your instructors. Um, today we're going to be learning about anatomy and physiology. This is going to be one of your longest sections, um, obviously because anatomy and physiology is extremely important. Um, you have to know how the body works in order to um, become a phlebotomist because you have to know why you would be drawing blood, what types of tests you'll be doing on what types of um, systems and organs um, and what could be the issue. So you always want to know the reasoning why behind your behind what you're doing um, so that you're always obviously well informed. Um, anatomy is the study of the body's physical structure. So that means what you have in your body, what organs you have in your body, where they are in your body, um, and why they reside where they reside. Um, physiology, on the other hand, is the study of the body's functional processes, how all the organ systems work together and to, to make us um, continue to live. Um, obviously, because survival is the most important human function, um, and in order for that to happen, all of the processes have to work together. All of the body systems have to work together. If the body system shut down and the organs shut down, we are unable to survive. And that, that is obviously the number one goal of the human body. So we're going to start with cells. Um, and cell structures. Obviously, the cell is the smallest living unit in the body. The body is made up of complete, a complete unit of cells. Um, so there are millions and millions of cells inside your body um, that make up every part of you. Um, the cell has what they call a nucleus, which is the center of the cell. It contains all your DNA. So from the time you're conceived, that DNA is what makes up everything that is individually you, your hair color, your eye color, your skin color, um, how big or small you are, how tall, um, everything. Um, it's made up of parts, takes part of your mother and your father and puts the DNA in there and that's you. Um, mitochondria is the cells like, we'll call it the power plant. Um, it burns fuel like sugars and fats and it burns it with oxygen to help supply the cell um, so that it is able to be energized. Um, you have to be able to have mitochondria and energy in order to survive because every cell has to be energized in order for the human body to live. Um, and then there's the cytoplasm, which is all the cellular material except for the plasma membrane and nucleus. Um, there is a fluid inside the cell um, they are inside the cytoplasm, which is called cytosol, which is where all of these nutrients are stored. And this is the cell structure. Um, it has the nucleus, the membranes, mitochondria, it has the um, plasma membrane, which is the outside of the cell and encloses it. Um, and it's just got all the different parts of the cell which make up um, the human body. I said the plasma membrane encloses the cell and it regulates what goes in, in and out of the cell. So it brings in nutrients and energy for the cell and pushes out all of the waste products, um, whatever they may be for um, the specific cell. Okay, cells of similar structure um, and function, they combine and they make tissues. Um, and our human body is composed of four types of tissues, which are epithelial, muscle, nerve, and connective. Um, the epithelial tissue is like a flat sheet of tissue and it's found on the surface of the body and that's where the exchange with nutrients in the environment take place. It allows sweat and liquid to leave the body. It allows liquid to come into the body. It allows 
um, like vitamin D from the sun to come in and other vitamins that are in the um, atmosphere to come into your body so that you're able to survive. Um, muscle tissue, it is contractile. It is able to shorten itself and lengthen itself. Um, it contains long fibers of protein um, and those fibers are what produce the muscle contraction and elongation that allows our body to move. Um, nervous tissue is specifically for um, communication between cells. It also um, comprises electrical impulses which allow us to move our muscle tissues and just do everyday functions. Um, it's mainly in your brain and spinal cord, but it's throughout your body as well, so that you, when your brain tells your fingers to move, it allows your fingers to move. And then the final These are just a picture of the four different types of cells. Obviously the connective tissue is more like, almost like little ropes that help connect all the other tissues together. Epithelial is what allows us to take in nutrients and expel nutrients. Um, muscle tissue is more of a flat tissue which allows it to contract um, and expand. And then nervous tissue has all of the nerve um, and neurons and different things in it to allow these electrical connections. So the next thing we're going to talk about um, is organs. Obviously, they're the structural unit in the body. Um, they are without our organs, we are unable to survive. Um, the really the we have two organs that that we have two of um, the kidneys and the lungs. So we have two lungs, two kidneys. Everything else we have one of, and without that one, we are unable to survive. Um, the heart, lungs, and kidneys have all different, all four types of tissues in them. The epithelial, the muscular, the connective, and the nervous, or the nerve. Um, and then the five organs that are essential for survival are the brain, heart, kidneys, liver, and lungs. Obviously the brain to make the rest of the body work correctly. Um, the heart to pump oxygen through the body and um, red, red blood cells. The kidney to excrete waste because we don't want waste buildup in our body. The liver um, filters most of um, what comes into our body. And the lungs which provide oxygen to our um, main organs and which is essential for life. Okay, some anatomic terminology that we're going to learn. Um, first, we're going to learn anatomic position. Um, it, the anatomic position is when the body is standing straight up or erect um, with your arm, with the body's facing forward, arms at your sides with your palms facing forward and your thumbs pointed out. Um, this is just called an anatomic position. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the way you need to stand or anything like that. It just happens to be um, the name that they gave it. There are also directional terms that you're going to need to know. Um, when someone asks you to do a blood draw from a specific side of the body, from a, a specific area of the body, you're going to need to know the um, medical terms in order to figure out where they're talking about. Um, so they're used to describe the relation of one body part to another. Um, so the where the arm relates to the middle of the body or where the head relates to the feet. Um, they're also used to describe emotion in relation to some part of the body. So like if you're putting your arm out straight and back down to the body, there's a directional term too that describes that motion. So some directional terms are ventral and anterior. These refer to the front surface of the body. 
um, routine venipuncture is performed on the ventral, ventral surface of the forearm um, on the opposite side of the elbow normally is where most people like to have their blood drawn from and that is the front the ventral and anterior is the front surface of the body the dorsal and posterior refer to the back surface of the body um, the hand venipuncture or the hand blood draw is performed on the dorsal surface of the hand so even though it might seem like that's the front of the hand it's the back of the hand where the if you look if you're staring at the backs of your hands that's where your the veins are so that is considered the uh, dorsal or posterior surface of your hand some more directional terms lateral means more towards the side away from the body's central axis so the central axis would be um, straight down the middle of the body. Uh, medial means more towards the middle, so medial is going to be more towards the body's central axis. And distal um, is going to mean farther from the point of origin of the structure in question. So let's say we're talking about the elbow. Um, distal is going to be the further, a far point from the elbow. So it's either the fingers or the um, shoulder so it's going to be further away from the actual elbow proximal means close to the point of attachment so for instance if we're talking about the shoulder the proximal point is where the shoulder actually attaches to the trunk of the body so that's what they call proximal um, inferior if you're going to talk about being inferior to the elbow, you're going to be down towards the hand. So it's going to be below the elbow. And then superior is going to be the opposite, which means above. So if you're talking about superior to the elbow, you're going to be up towards the shoulder um, where it attaches to the body. So that's above. So some more directional terms, the term prone means lying face down on the stomach. Um, so if you're lying in bed and you lie on, if you're a stomach sleeper, you're, you lie in the prone position. Um, full prone position is when your face is actually um, face down, like in the floor, in the bed, whatever. But um, lying, on your, lying on your stomach is a prone position. Um, a supine position is the complete opposite. It's when you're lying on your back facing up. So if you're a back sleeper, you sleep in the supine position. Um, so that's, I always think of supine as like a, a spoon holding soup. You're kind of lying face up. The spoon is facing up with the soup in it. So that's how I always remember supine. The term flexion is going to refer to a movement that bends a joint. So if you're bending your elbow and your fit, we'll say your fist or your hand can touch your shoulder, that's a flexion movement, a movement that flexes um, your arm. An extension is the complete opposite. It's when you're, if you're extending your arm, it's when your hand is as far away from the shoulder as it can be. That's an extended arm or an extended position. Abduction is going to be a movement that takes a body part away from the central axis. So for instance, if you're standing straight up with your hands at your side and you pick your arms up so you, your body is in a cross position, your arms are abducted right at that point away from your body. So you're, you have performed what they call abduction. Um, adduction is the complete opposite, which brings the body part closer. So if you're standing with your body in a cross position where your arms are straight out and you bring your arms back towards, lower them and bring them back towards your body, that's called adduction. I remember that because you're adding your arms back towards your body. These just show some directional terms um, that tell us where the body parts are located. Um, the woman who's standing on the left-hand side is in anatomical position. That's an anatomical position that, and the rest of the pictures are the directional terms. 
um, that relate to the anatomical position. There are also what we call body planes. These divide the body into um, upper, lower, right, left, front, back. Um, so the sagittal plane divides the body into left and right. So it would be straight down the central axis or the middle of your body, which cuts your body into left and right um, planes. The frontal is going to divide the body into front and back. So it's going to be straight down the opposite way. So your face is obviously going to be the front. The back of your head is going to be the back. And then transverse is going to divide your body into top and bottom. So from like your belly button up is going to be the top and from your belly button down is going to be the bottom. That's called transverse. And this is just a picture of the different planes of the body. Okay, so body cavities. Um, the body is divided into two larger body cavities called ventral and dorsal. Um, they are also subdivided to form eight major body cavities. So when you're looking at body cavities, you're going to be talking about a cavity that has specific organs in, inside it. So the thoracic cavity um, is going to contain the heart and the lungs. It goes from basically your from where the bottom of your lungs would be up so it's going to just it's all it's going to contain is your heart which is the pericardial cavity and the lungs which is the pleural cavity <clears throat> um, and then the abdominal cavity obviously is going to have all the abdominal um, stomach area so it's going to contain the stomach intestines spleen liver gallbladder pancreas and kidneys um, all of these, except for the kidneys, are going to be in what they call the peritoneal cavity. Um, and then the pelvic cavity, which is the next cavity, is going to, the pelvic cavity is going to contain the bladder, rectum, ovaries, and testes. So that's going to be your reproductive area, the area where you um, release waste. So the other major body cavity is the dorsal cavity. Um, it's going to contain the cranial, which contains the brain, and the spinal, which contains the spinal cord. Um, that is, for the most part, all those cavities. Um, the dorsal cavity just contains the cranial and the spinal. So the next we're going to talk about are the body systems, um, all the way from integumentary, musculoskeletal, nervous, the circulatory system, respiratory system, digestive system, urinary, reproductive, endocrine, and immune. All all of these systems are what make up your, your body and, and how they work together. Um, the integumentary system contains consists of skin, epithelial connective nervous tissues, oil, and sweat glands. Um, this is the outside of the um, covering of the body. So this is what protects your body against diseases and bacteria and viruses getting in as well as, it, as, as good as it can. Um, and obviously the primary goal is protection. It's also the largest system in the body because your skin from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head, it is it contains within it all the other body systems.
Um, some of the features of the integumentary system, which all of our body systems have features, um, its principal function is protection and thermoregulation. Thermoregulation being body temperature. Um, it helps to regulate to make sure your body doesn't get too hot or too cold. Um, so it helps to sustain your life um, based on your body temperature. It also, one of its principal functions is sensation. So it will help you sense when you're too cold or when you're too hot or when you feel pain, um, different things like that. Um, and it's also the first line of offense against infection because it encompasses all of our other body systems and allows them not to um, be invaded by outside um, viruses and um, infections and different things like that. Now, obviously it always doesn't always work, but it definitely w it works better than if we did not have the integumentary system. So there are two layers of the integumentary system. There's the dermis, which is the inner layer, and there's the epidermis, which is the outer layer. So the epidermis is what you see at your skin on the outside. Underneath the epidermis is an inner layer called the dermis, which is just another layer of protection inside your skin. So more features of the integumentary system. Um, in all of our skin, we have glands um, that help us to excrete um, sweat and oil and different things that not only help us to get rid of um, um, toxins in the body, they also help to um, lubricate the skin, lubricate the hair. Um, so that like the sweat glands located in the dermis, they produce, produce sweat so that they can um, regulate your body temperature. That's what's called thermoregulation. So if you don't sweat, your body will remain warm all the time and your body temperature will continue to rise and that is not um, compatible with life. So you want to make sure that when you get hot, your body actually sweats. And that's what the sweat glands do inside the integumentary system. Um, sebaceous glands, they produce an oily substance called sebum that lubricates the skin and hair so that our body does not get extremely dry. Um, that's one of the reasons that uh, the older population, um, they have such dry skin because they their sebaceous glands don't work as well. Um, some of the disorders of the integumentary system um, you can get a fungal infection, which is called ringworm. Um, you can get bacterial infections like staph or staphylococcus, strep or streptococcus. Most of these bacteria are on or in our body already. It's just when they become over, like there's an overabundance that you actually get these, um, like these infections like the staph or the strep. Um, also things like skin cancer, carcinoma, melanoma, these are disorders of the integumentary system, acne um, when you're a teenager or even older, and then psoriasis when your um, skin gets really, really, um, really dry and itchy and red. Some of the laboratory tests you may be drawing blood for. Um, for integumentary disorders are going to be things like CNS, which is culture and sensitivity. Um, there's a KOH, potassium hydroxide prep, and then you may be doing um, things, uh, drawing blood for skin biopsies and different, different things like that. So this is just some of the common things you may be drawing for if someone has an issue with their integumentary system. And this is just a picture of the um, integumentary system or a, like a piece of skin. Um, obviously the outside is going to have the sweat glands or the pores. Um, you're going to see the epidermis, the dermis, and then even underneath that is the hypodermis, which is um, another layer underneath the epidermis and dermis. Um, inside all this, you're going to have hair follicles and sebaceous glands. You're going to have blood vessels and lymph vessels, um, veins, arteries, different things. So the, the, the integumentary system is made up of an extreme amount of um, different, they, it provides different functions that really help with um, the compatibility of life. 
um, to help you regulate your temp body temperature and, and uh, fight off diseases and different things like that. Okay, next we're going to move on to the skeletal system. Obviously, this is extremely important, important as well. Um, it provides the framework for the body. So if you walk into anatomy class and something else and you happen to see a, a skeleton up there, um, that's what the skeletal system is. Um, it's what helps you stand erect. Um, it includes all of the bones, muscles, joints, and connective tissue um, that provide the framework for the body. It also allows the body to move and protects um, the body and gives it shape. Um, if you didn't have your bones, you your organs would be exposed. So when you fell or when you got hit or whatever it was, those organs would be much more susceptible to damage because of your um, the lack of protection from the skeletal system. Some of the features of the bones, um, there are 206 bones in the adult skeleton. Um, they range from long bones, short bones, um, some of them are very thick, some are very thin. Um, some of them are really not even needed, but they're still there. Um, they're held together with ligaments, um, just because if otherwise they'd just be floating around and they wouldn't, they wouldn't be a framework, they'd just be random bones inside your body. Um, they're classified by their shape, so they are classified as long bones, short bones, flat bones, sesamoid, or irregular. So the long bones are going to include um, the arm, what the bones that are in your arms and your legs. So some more features of the bones. The short bones are going to be found in your wrists and your ankles. Obviously, these are extremely short bones because your wrists, I mean, they're only, they're very, very small bones. And they're also relatively, um, I don't know what the word is, they're, they're, they break more easily than, we'll say, like the long bones of your legs. So your flat bones are going to protect your inner, inner organs, such as your heart and your brain, um, your skull is all um, flat bones that protect your that protect your um, brain um, and then your heart is protected by your sternum which is a completely flat bone um, and it helps to protect so when you if you get hit in the chest it's going to protect it your heart is underneath it So the sesamoid, it means shaped like a sesame seed. So it's going to be your patella or your kneecap. So it's basically just a round bone that sits on top of your knee, um, the bones of your knee, which protects, it does protect your knee and it, it it's more of a movable type bone, but it definitely um, protects. So the irregular bones um, are going to be those that are not classified as one of the other types. So your ribs. Um, you have ribs in your body that are not considered long, short, or, uh, or sesamoid. They're just irregular because it's one classification that's not... Um, it's just every other bone in your body that's not classified as long, short, or sesamoid. Okay, so we're moving on to joints. Some of the features of joints are they connect bone to one another. Um, so obviously this is something that's good because if we didn't have um, any sort of connective tissue to from bone to bone, you just have random bones in your body and it would not be able to protect the body um, the way it should. Some of the types of joints are
Okay, so some bone and joint disorders, obviously any sort of fracture or trauma um, to a bone or a joint is going to be an issue because you're going to have to have a cast or a splint or something to make sure that um, it heals properly. Um, scoliosis, which is um, a back curvature, spina bifida, osteomyelitis and acromegaly are some other bone and joint disorders. And then obviously things like Lyme disease, arthritis, lupus, osteoarthritis, and gout are going to be bone and joint disorders. Um, some common laboratory tests for bone and joint disorders that you might be Pulling, as far as um, when I say pulling, I mean drawing blood for would be an ALP, an alkaline phosphatase, an ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, um, RF or rheumatoid factor. Um, then you're going to be oh, pulling for electrolytes, calcium, magnesium, uric acid, um, synovial fluid analysis, and then an ANA, which is a fluorescent antinuclear antibody. These are different um, common laboratory tests you may be asked to draw blood to test for. And then just here's a picture of the skeletal system, all the different bones um, in, in the skeletal system that make up the framework of your body. So next we're gonna talk about the muscular system. Obviously the muscular system moves the skeletal, skeletal, skeletal system or the bones um, and it also, muscular system pumps the heart, the heart obviously being the most important muscle in the body. Um, obviously, if we don't have the contraction of the heart through not only physical but electrical impulses, we are not able to survive. Um, some of the features of muscle accounts for 45% of the weight of our body. So the more muscle you gain, the more your um, body weight will go up. Um, you have what you call an agonist muscle. Um, it carries out intended movement. So um, an intended movement would be moving your arm from the side of your body to a straight, a straight out position. And then you're going to have an antagonist muscle. That's a muscle that opposes the intended movement. So it's going to be the opposite of the intended movement. Um, some disorders of the muscular system are going to be trauma. Trauma is going to be for any system. Um, muscular dystrophy, which is going to be um, obviously when you're unable to control your muscles the way you should be able to. Um, Mycinius gravis and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or ALS. Um, you may have heard the, heard the disease, Lou Gehrig's disease. That's what ALS is. And then some common laboratory blood draws or tests for muscle disorders you may see come across on a requisition are aldolase um, and then AST, um, CKMM, which is create, creatinine kinase. I have such a hard time with those words. Um, those have to do with the heart. The creatinine kinase, MB and MM, have to do with the heart. And myoglobin and troponin also have to do with the heart and um, muscle wastage. And then here's just a picture of the muscle system, um, the different muscles in the body um, from the front, the front and the back. So we're moving on to the nervous system. Um, the nervous system includes the central nervous system and the which includes the brain and spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system, which includes all of the neurons outside of the central nervous system. Um, the nervous system controls, directs, and coordinates body functions um, through the impulses in, that go from neuron to neuron.
And then just like I said, two of the main divisions are the central nervous system, which include the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which is everything else except the brain and spinal cord. And then these are just some of the major nerves of the body. And this is a picture of the central versus the peripheral. Um, so you can see exactly what each encompasses. So the peripheral nervous the peripheral nervous system is divided into two major divisions, which is the sensory division and the somatic division. Um, so sensory neurons, which are called afferents, they receive stimulation from special cells within their sensory organs. So their sensory organs are eyes, nose, mouth, ears, skin, and subcutaneous tissues. So joints, muscles, internal organs. Um, these things are what you sense. So you sense either you can smell, you can hear, um, you know, the sometimes when you get scared, the hair on your skin, will, um, your arms will grow. The, these are different sensations that you are able to sense. So you're also, you also have motor neurons, which are called efferent. Um, they receive information from the spinal cord and they carry information to a target, um, which is either a muscle or a gland. So if you want to move your finger, your motor neurons um, will send a signal to your finger to move because it's an actual um, move, movement. You're also going to have an interneuron, which conveys information between the afferent and the efferent or the um, sensory and motor neurons. And they're located, this is located, the interneurons are located in the central nervous system, so in the brain and spinal cord. So the peripheral nervous system contains nerves, which are bundled neurons that are in the periphery. They're not in the brain and spinal cord. They're in the other parts of the body. Um, and they send electrical impulses or receive electrical impulses. Um, they also can contain motor neurons or um, contain only motor neurons or sensory neurons or can be a mixture um, of both different types. So your motor system is divided into two branches, somatic and autonomic. Um, the somatic motor neurons, they inter innervate or they weave around your skeletal muscle and they're con consciously controlled. So what, what I mean is your body, you know you want to move your hand. So it's a conscious effort to move your hand or your arm. You know you're doing it, you're trying to do it. Um, the autonomic motor neurons innervate the cardiac and smooth muscle, and they can't be consciously controlled. You can't tell these neurons to make your heart pump. They just automatically do it. You, you have no control over it. Um, not like moving your arm or moving your foot or moving your leg. The body does not want you to be able to control your own heartbeat because you, you would have to constantly saying, be, be um, thinking about your heartbeat as opposed to other functions. So your central nervous system contains bundled neurons that are called tracks that ascend and descend from your nerves. Um, they also, your central nervous system contains your brainstem where the spinal cord merges at the base of the skull. Um, if you do not have your brainstem, you are not able to live. It is vital for life because its major process includes respiration or breathing. Um, and without being able to breathe, you are unable to live. So your brainstem if you damage your brainstem, um, it is most likely going to be incompatible with life. So some of the other organs in the central nervous system are going to be the thalamus. Um, this is a major relay station for incoming sensory information. So it's going to receive the information and it's going to send it out to the correct place. 
Um, the cerebellum, cerebellum is the site for receiving and interpreting motor commands. So if your brain tells you to move your finger, it's your cerebellum that's going to receive and interpret that signal. It's going to say, okay, the brain wants me to move the finger and the finger is going to move. The cerebrum it contains the cerebral cortex, which is divided into right and left hemispheres. Um, the cerebral cortex, hold on, let me change slides and then. So your cerebral cortex is the site of all thoughts, emotion, and memory. So obviously it's an extremely important part of the brain. Um, you're, if you don't have it, you're not able to think, have emotion, and you don't have any memory. So obviously this is <laughs> very important. Um, the brain is kind of strange because the right cerebral hemisphere is going to control the left side of the body, and the left cerebral hemisphere is going to control the right side of the body. So a lot of times when people are having like a stroke on the left hemisphere of the body, the right side will be affected. So you're always going to be able to tell which side people who've like had a stroke have which side of the brain they've experienced it on because they're going to be affected on the other side of the body. More parts of the central, more parts of the central nervous system is the cerebrospinal fluid. Um, this is fluid that goes up and down your spinal cord and nourishes and cushions the brain and circulates in the ventricles of the brain, which is the top part of the brain. Um, without the ventricles, you are unable to, um, your brain is unable to survive. You have three membranes around your brain. Um, one is called the pia, mat pia matter, pia matter. Um, the arachnoid and the dura matter. Um, these lubricate and protect the brain. Um, as well as the bones, the bones of the skull. Um, some of the disorders of the nervous system um, are trauma, obviously any trauma towards the head, to the head, concussion, um, subarachnoid hemorrhage, which means a blood vessel burst in your brain, um, stroke, um, an infection of the brain, meningitis, polio, shingles, and then de degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and ALS, um, and autoimmune diseases like Guillain-Barre and multiple sclerosis. Now things like ALS and multiple sclerosis, even though they're, they're considered muscular diseases, they're also considered nervous system diseases because it's part of the brain that is unable to tell the muscles to move. Okay, some disorders of the nervous system um, are some developmental disorders anyway, are cerebral palsy or cerebral palsy and epilepsy. And then there's also psychiatric illnesses, which um, cause the brain to not work as properly as it should, um, which would be bipolar disorder, depression, and schizophrenia. Uh, obviously, depression is one of the more common ones. Some of the laboratory tests you're going to be running for neurological disorders would be CSF, which is cerebrospinal fluid analysis, um, culture and gram stain, um, the electrolytes, protein, and glucose, and then you're going to be doing a cell count and differential. This is just a this is just a picture of the nervous system and, and the nerves that where they run through, um, whether they belong to the brain and spinal cord or the, the other parts of the body. This brings us to the respiratory system, um, which obviously is extremely important. It's responsible for bringing oxygen to the lungs and removing carbon dioxide from metabolic processes. In your blood, you have what's called hemoglobin, and it's what allows oxygen to be carried to and from, um, to around the body, um, oxygen to the body and carbon dioxide away from the body or from the lungs. Um, it relies on the circulatory system to transport gases to and from the lungs. It includes the upper airways of uh, the nasal passages and throat. 
and the lower airways include the trachea, larynx, bronchi, which are inside the lungs and the lungs themselves. It also involves the muscles of respiration in the abdomen, chest, and neck. Um, the biggest muscle would be the diaphragm. It's what allows our chest cavity to expand and contract um, when we bring in air and push air out. So respiration is not just internal, it's external. Um, external respiration refers to gas exchange in the lungs, and internal respiration refers to the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide at the cellular level. So not just in the lungs, but bringing oxygen to the cells so that your body can survive. Some disorders of the respiratory system are obviously any sort of respiratory infection, pneumonia, strep throat, tuberculosis, um, upper respiratory infection, and even just the common cold. Um, any inflammation, bronchitis, emphysema, pleurisy, um, obstructions, which would be considered asthma, COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, and pulmonary edema. And then things that cause insufficient ventilation, which would be ALS, muscular dystrophy, polio, and any sort of spinal cord injury. Additional disorders of the respiratory system include any developmental disorder like infant respiratory distress syndrome or SIDS, which is sudden infant death syndrome. Um, and any neoplastic disease, which um, includes all different types of lung cancer. Some common laboratory tests you'll be drawing will be um, an ABG, which is an arterial blood gas, um, pH for the acidity in the blood, uh, carbon dioxide and oxygen levels in the blood, then any electrolytes in the blood, there's quite a few that you would be drawing for for respiratory disorders. Um, you may be doing cultures, which are throat sw uh, swabs, bronchial washings. You are also um, be drawing for PPD, which is purified protein derivative, and RSV, which is respiratory synactovirus. This is just a picture of the respiratory system. It shows all the way from the nasal cavity down to the bottom of the lungs, the different structures in the lungs. Okay, so we're moving on to the digestive system. Um, it breaks down food physically and chemically so it could be absorbed for use by the cells. Um, also the, be absorbed um, so that the cells can receive nutrients. Um, components include the mouth, um, esophagus, stomach, liver, large intestines, rectum, anus, liver, gallbladder, and pancreas, which is obviously everything pretty much from your mouth um, down to your, um, the top of your legs. So, so the digestive process um, goes from your mouth to your stomach. Um, chewing your food allows faster attack of enzymes um, of your stomach and intestine. You have enzymes everywhere from inside your mouth um, that help to break down food and um, pull out nutrients. Um, and then obviously down into your stomach and intestine um, as well. Your saliva lubricates the food and it allows it to pass easily into your esophagus. Um, the smooth muscles of your esophagus uh, perform a wave-like motion called peristalsis, forcing food into the stomach. It's kind of like a contraction and relaxation um, movement that allows it to push the food from your throat down to your stomach. During the digestive process, your stomach churns the food, um, and this is the first and beginning process of chemical digestion. 
um, your mouth is what starts the process of physically digesting the food as you chew it up, but the stomach churns it in, um, starts the process of chemical. Um, as well, in the digestive process, your small intestine, um, it has digestive enzymes that break food down even further um, into sugars, fat, um, different different types of sugars which are carbohydrates and allows these nutrients to be carried away to the liver um, so that they can be stored and processed for energy at later times. Um, fat is absorbed by the lymphatic system and it's not is not absorbed by the blood. In the balance of the digestive process, obviously your large intestine, which carries waste um, out of your body to be eliminated through the anus. Um, any remaining material passes into the large intestine that's in your stomach or your colon, and you, you have water in your colon that, um, well, first of all, helps to break it down. And then any water that you have, once it's done, is reabsorbed um, and indigestible solid material form forms feces, um, which are eliminated obviously through the anus. So that's what the large intestine end um, does for as far as elimination. The liver is one of the most important organs in digestion because it processes nutrients um, throughout the body and also stores them for future use for energy. Um, it produces bile that is stored in the gallbladder, which actually ends up sometimes hurting <laughs> the gallbladder because it causes stones, but it also, it's that's where the bile is stored in the gallbladder. And liver is where the carbohydrates are stored for immediate use for energy. Um, they're also stored for later energy later as well. Some disorders of the digestive system include any type of infection, appendicitis, gastroenteritis, giardiasis, hepatitis, and ulcers, and then inflammation um, in the digestive system would include, include cholecystitis, which is an inflamed gallbladder, pancreatitis, and peritonitis, um, chemical damage, say from like alcohol, a cirrhosis of the liver, gallstones, and any sort of autoimmune disease where the human body attacks itself, which would include Crohn's disease. Um, common laboratory tests that you will be um, drawing will be amylase and lipase, um, carotene, gastrin, any sort of occult blood, which is blood in the stool, ova and parasites, and then a stool culture. CBC is very common. You'll be drawing that for a lot of different um, systems, which is a complete blood count. Um, any sort of liver test, which is ALP, ALT, AST, and GGT. Um, bilirubin and ammonia. And then liver diseases, hepatitis B and C. This is just a picture of the digestive system and the different organs that are included um, from your mouth down to your anus. So we move on to the urinary system. Um, the urinary system rids the body of waste and helps produce urine. Um, any waste that's in your blood is filtered by the kidneys into um, the urinary system and comes out as urine. This includes your kidneys, bladder, and urethra. Um, it also maintains an acid-base balance and regulates body hydration. Um, it also produces hormones that help regulate blood, um, blood pressure um, and also regulate the production of red blood cells. So the urinary system is extremely important, um, obviously, 
there are people who can live without um, one of their two kidneys um, or if you go into kidney failure there are different machines that are able to help you still rid your body of these wastes however you can't you most people cannot live on them for their entire life they have to have some sort of kidney transplant Um, disorders of the urinary system include um, any sort of infection, once again, which is cystitis, glomerulonephritis, um, polynephritis, and any sort of urinary tract infection, and then the chemical disorder of um, kidney stones. common laboratory test you'll be drawing for any sort of urologic disorder is going to be um, BUN, which is blood urea nitrogen, um, creatinine and creatinine clearance, culture and sensitivity, um, electrolytes, any sort of electrolytes, these are very important to the urinary system, osmolity, um, protein and renin, and then a routine urinalysis where you are not necessarily drawing blood but you're um, getting a urine sample. This is a picture of the uh, the organs in the urinary system, the kidneys, the urethra, the ureters, the bladder. Um, these are the main components in the urinary system. So we move on to the reproductive system. Um, in men, it produces and ejaculates sperm, which obviously meets with an egg for a woman. Um, the woman produces mature eggs and uh, allows for their fertilization and hosts and nourishes the embryos that develops um, during pregnancy. So the male reproductive system includes the scrotum. These enclose the testes, which is the site of sperm. It's where the sperm is produced and stored. It passes from the testes into the epididymis and they're able to mature there. Um, once they are mature, they pass into the vas deferens and they're stored prior to ejaculation. So the female reproductive system includes ovaries, which produce eggs that mature every month with the hormones FSH and LH. The FSH is follicle stimulating hormone and the LH is luteinizing hormone. Estrogen <coughs> and progesterone help to build the uterine lining in preparation for implantation. And that's where the egg implants and is able to um, grow and mature into a, a human baby. Um, after ovulation occurs and the egg enters the fallopian tubes and moves towards the uterus. Um, if fertilization does occur, this is where and when it happens. Um, and it's when the sperm enters the fallopian tube and un unites with the egg and then it travels down into the uterus. Some disorders of the male reproductive system include benign prosthetic hyperplasia, and this is where it makes it very difficult to urinate for men because their um, prostate becomes inflamed. Um, prostatic cancer or prostate cancer, um, any sort of sexually transmitted disease, including gonorrhea, genital herpes, syphilis, and then HIV, hum human immunodeficiency virus. And then sperm malformation is when the sperm are just not formed properly. And disorders of the female reproductive system include the types, different types of cancer, which include cervical, vagina, and uterine. Um, fibroids, which usually are in the uterus, and they're benign uterine tumors. 
um, endometriosis, which is where the um, the skin, I guess, if you want to call it, or the tissue of the uterus grows not only inside the uterus, but outside the uterus. Um, pelvic inflammatory disease and PMS. Additional disorders would be the sexually transmitted diseases, which include gonorrhea, genital herpes, syphilis, um, HIV, chlamydia, and trichomonasis, and then toxic shock syndrome, where um, toxins or um, bacteria grow on um, tampons that have been left in too long. Some common laboratory tests for reproductive disorders are going to be culture and sensitivity, estradiol, estrogen, um, human chorionic gonadotropin, which is HCG, which um, is the te pregnancy test, a pap smear, um, prostate-specific antigen, Additional laboratory tests are going to include um, rapid plasma regain, semen analysis, and testosterone. This is just a picture of the male and female reproductive systems um, and where they set inside the body. I think most of us know that, but, um, and include all the different organs that um, make up the female and male reproductive system. So we're moving on to the endocrine system, which is actually my favorite system. I just find it fascinating how all these hormones work together to make the body processes do what they do. Um, it's made up of glands called endocrine glands. Um, these glands secrete chemical substances <coughs> called hormones into the bloodstream, which make create other functions in the body. Um, they function with the nervous system to regulate body functions. So some of the glands of the endocrine system include the pituitary gland, which is called the master gland, and it's a very, very small gland that's in your brain. And it's involved in almost every aspect of the endocrine system. Um, the next is the thyroid gland. Um, it regulates energy consumption rate of virtually every cell in the bodily the body. Um, it's what makes metabolism. So some of the glands of the endocrine system also include the parathyroid gland, which regulates the amount of calcium and phosphorus in circulation, um, the thymus gland, which, help, which helps maintain immunity, and the pancreas, which produces insulin and glucagon, which regulate the level of sugar glucose in the blood. Um, this is the organ that dysfunctions when people, um, and it causes di uh, diabetes in people. Additional glands. Additional glands are the adrenal gland. Adrenal means above the kidney, so these glands sit directly above the kidney. They're composed of two parts, um, which include the adrenal medulla and the adrenal cortex. The adrenal medulla uh, secretes epinephrine and norepinephrine which increase heart rate, blood flow to the skeletal muscles, and they produce a feeling of, um, heightened feeling of awareness and anticipation crucial to the fight or flight response. So it's like when we get scared, um, the, our epinephrine and norepinephrine increase, which causes us to either um, fight whatever it is that we're afraid of or flee from that.
the adrenal cortex. Um, this secretes steroids, steroid hormones, which include the glucocorticoids, which are cortisol, cortisone, and corti corti <laughs> it's hard for me to say it, corticosterone. Um, and then the mineral corticoids, which are aldosterone. Additional glands include the gonads, which are the ovaries and testes. Um, the testes produce testosterone for men, and the ovaries produce estrogen and progesterone for women. So some disorders of the endocrine system include hypersecretion disorders, hyper meaning too much um, of whatever hormone it is is being secreted. Um, which um, causes acromegaly or gigantism, gigantism, which means your all of your um, features are overly large. Um, Cushing disease, Graves disease, and hyperinsulinism. And then there's hyposecretion disorders, which is when not enough of the hormone is being secreted, um, which include Addison's disease, diabetes insipidus, diabetes mellitus, which is the diabetes you um, know from, um, it's the one that's more mainstream, I guess if you want to call it, the one where people use insulin, um, hypothyroidism, and pituitary dwarfism. Some common lab tests you'll be um, drawing would be calcium, catecholamines, and cortisol. Um, you'll be taking fasting glucose, which is when people don't eat for a certain period of time and you um, test the glucose in your blood. FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone. GH, which is growth hormone. And LH, which is luteinizing hormone. Some additional common laboratory tests would be PTH, which is parathyroid hormone. You're going to test for phosphorus. You're going to test for T3, T4, and TSH, um, which indicates hypo or hyperthyroidism. Um, testosterone, you're going to do a, you may do a thyroid function study, and you're going to test for vitamin D. This is just a picture of the endocrine system um, and where all the glands lie um, in the body.